All right, um, the Mexican Revolution is, is worthy of study in part because it, it's complicated. Uh, it's a multi-sided revolution, uh, and there were various uh, revolutionary interests. One of them was the proletariat, uh, urban workers, uh, which is not a huge part, but an important part. And it's best represented by an organization called La Casa del Obrero Mundial, which means the House of the World Worker. Uh, so this is a short video to discuss the role of um, proletarian uh, uh, revolutionary thought in the Mexican Revolution. Now, uh, Obrero Mundial w was not uh, so much about uh, straight-up Marxist communism uh, as it was something called anarcho-syndicalism. So we have to define that first. Um, it's also referred to as revolutionary syndicalism. It's a theory of anarchism which views revolutionary industrial unionism, which is or syndicalism, a syndicate of unions, as a method for workers in capitalist society to gain control of an economy and with that control to influence broader society. Syndicalists uh, consider their economic theories a strategy uh, for facilitating worker self-activity as an alternative um, and as an alternative cooperative economic system with democratic values and production centered on meeting human needs. It's not about uh, the needs of uh, the bourgeoisie, but about meeting everyone's uh, material needs. Now, the basic principles of anarcho-syndicalism are solidarity, the workers sticking together to make their actions effective, uh, direct action, means action undertaking without the intervention of third parties like politicians, bureaucrats, or arbitrators. The workers themselves are going to do it. Um, and then finally, direct democracy, or, or workers' self-management. A direct democracy would be where literally uh, the, the, the people vote on every piece of legislation. Ancient Greece was like this. Um, so they will the, the, the workers will literally uh, vote on and, and decide everything. Um, the end goal of anarcho-syndicalism is to abolish the wage system, uh, which, which they regard as wage slavery. Uh, you're, you're, by these meager wages, uh, bound to this job. Um, we're going to get rid of wage slavery and just we're going to give everybody what they need. Um, anarcho-syndicalist theory, therefore, generally focuses on the labor movement. Uh, labor should replace the state. Here's where the anarchy comes in. Uh, there, there's, there's no state. States are bad. They exploit people. Uh, so labor will sort of become the state. Anarcho-syndicalists view the primary purpose of the state as being the defense of private property, uh, therefore the bourgeoisie, <clears throat> and therefore of economic, social, and political privilege, denying most of its um, you know, citizens the ability to enjoy material independence and the social autonomy which springs from material independence. Now, in contrast with other bodies of thought, particularly Marxism and Leninism, anarcho-syndicalists deny there can be any kind of worker state or a state which acts in, um, uh, acts in the interest of workers, as opposed to those of the powerful, and they believe that any state with the intention of empowering the workers will inevitably work to empower itself or the existing elite at the expense of workers. And this is what happened to the former Soviet Union. You had an elite. It was just a different elite than, than under capitalism. Uh, Anarcho-syndicalists want to avoid that. Reflecting the anarchist philosophy from which it draws its primary inspiration, anarcho-syndicalism holds the idea that power corrupts. Now, the Casa del Obrero Mundial, House of the World Worker, or the COM, uh, was a socialist and anarcho-syndicalist workers organization uh, launched in Mexico City uh, founded on September 22, 1912, um, and it served as <clears throat> a cultural institution promoting workers' education and social transformation through a socialist orientation and as a headquarters for a number of syndicates and unions on a mutual aid basis. Um, the Casa was uh, at the center of the Mexican labor movement in the early 20th century and was nourished in part by Spanish anarcho-syndicalist exiles of something called the CNT, the Con Confederation Nacional de Trabajo, which was a Spanish group um, who got kind of oppressed and kicked out of Spain and came to Mexico with their anarchist values. 
Uh, they brought uh, important knowledge uh, of their labor, labor struggle and experiences with them from Europe. At the time, the Mexican labor movement was relatively advanced, uh, and though it was not a predominantly industrial economy, uh, its non-peasant workers were fairly conscious of popular struggle and their weight in society. So we have a proletariat, industrial proletariat in Mexico. It's naturally not giant because most Mexicans are you know, peasants working in the agrarian sector, but still it's significant. Um, and this movement was born of the general uprising of the Mexican Revolution after long periods of heavy-handed repression of labor under the Porfiriato. Speaking of the Porfiriato, I, I should mention that the most prominent anarchist uh, then was uh, Ricardo Flores Magón, uh, generally known as Flores Magón, um, and his followers were called Magonistas. Flores Magón was an important Mexican anarchist and an advocate for social reform. He was aided in his political activities by his brothers Enrique and Jesus. Uh, he was one of the major thinkers of the Mexican Revolution. Uh, and the Mexican revolutionary movement in the um, um, Partido Liberal Mexicano, the Mexican Liberal Party. He organized uh, the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, which is, you know, uh, in many countries and is often the most radical labor group. That was true in the United States. Um, he added a Mexican anarchist newspaper, Re Regeneración, I guess that means regeneration, uh, which aroused the workers against the dictatorship of Diaz. The Magón brothers were from a family of modest means in Oaxaca, but all three studied law, and Flores was also a journalist, an antagonist of the Diaz regime. He spent a good time in jail because of this, and in 1904, he was forced to flee Mexico uh, when the courts banned the printing of his writings, and he remained in the USA for the remainder of his life, uh, which included, of course, the time of the Mexican Revolution, though he still had a significant role from afar. Um, he spent uh, half that time in the U.S. in, in, in prison. Um, he resumed the publication of his anarchist newspaper, and he led the, the PLM, the Mexican Liberal Party, the Mexi or Partido Liberal Mexicano, uh, from abroad. Uh, while being very involved in Mexican affairs, he also organized for labor causes in America and consorted with famed anarchists like Emma Goldman, whose boyfriend, you'll recall, was the one who tried to assassinate Henry Clay Frick. So that, this is why he got in trouble uh, in the U.S. He ultimately died in prison in Kansas at the age of 48 um, in 1922. All right, back to the COM. Um, it sought abolition of the Mexican state and the coordination of workers' syndicates into a confederated socialist economy. That's what anarchists don't really want, literally no kind of, government whatsoever. They want uh, a, co a cooperative confederation of, of workers um, to replace the state. In order to do this, it engaged in many strikes that hit Mexico before and during the revolution, uh, <clears throat> aiming for its preferred goal of a general strike. In a heavily agriculture-based economy, however, its alliance with the campesinos was crucial to its success. But in this aspect, it failed. Um, and through a the very convoluted situation of the revolution, uh, the COM <clears throat> allied itself with the Caranchistas for, uh, and formed red battalions. Carranza became president. He actually co-ops these people, and they, they formed these, uh, these red battalions, these workers hired uh, to go fight Zapata and Villa. This is very strange because Carranza, as you know, is, is fairly conservative, increasingly more conservative, uh, and these, the, the COM wants the abolition of the state. It's a weird, uh, they made for strange bedfellows. Um, but that, that's what happened. And the Red Battalions were, were to fight their supposedly counter-revolutionary enemies, mostly the Zapatistas. After Carranza suppressed Zapata and got rid of him, however, uh, strikes were banned by Carranza, and the, the, the Casa del Obrero Mundial went into decline, ultimately was pushed out of the labor opposition by officialized labor unions like the CROM, which the government could more easily control.